This episode of The Witch Wave is brought to you by the Disco Dolls Studio. The Disco Dolls Studio is a boutique, salon, and art gallery located in Tampa, Florida. Started by lovely sisters, the hairstylist Christine and fashion designer Leanne, together with their dear friend and artist Beth. The mission at the Disco Dolls is sustainable luxury. They aim to create a culture of quality, sustainability, and careful consumerism. With a nod to the past, they wish to captivate, fascinate, enchant, and charm the observer. Every Disco Dolls vendor is hand-selected, most of them being women creators and small batch makers. From the hand-poured candles made just down the street to the unique artisan jewelry and talismans they offer, each product is backed with the Disco Dolls' confidence. And the Disco Dolls' in-house clothing line features one-of-a-kind ceremonial pieces and the Uniform Project, a collection of sustainably made classic silhouettes for every body. Made from eco-friendly bamboo, these garments are made for whatever the day may bring you, and they are beautiful. Locals are encouraged to stop in to experience the difference of quality sustainability five days a week, including Saturdays, and everyone can visit their online store at thediscodolls.com to browse all the boutique has to offer. Follow them on their social media accounts, including Instagram and Facebook, at The Disco Dolls. This episode of The Witch Wave is brought to you by Blessed Be Magic. Blessed Be Magic is a jewelry brand for the modern witch, creating subtle and tasteful talisman jewelry to remind you of your magic. You're a modern witch living in the real world. And maybe it's not that your lifestyle is a secret, it's just that you're not exactly flying around on a broomstick wearing a pointy hat, and you are not alone. It can be hard to find subtle, witchy jewelry that you feel comfortable wearing every day. But that's why Blessed Be Magic was born. With over 700 five-star reviews, these tasteful talismans are designed to be worn with your existing jewelry collection or on their own. The beauty is, Blessed Be Magic jewelry won't draw unnecessary attention to your sacred beliefs. Plus, you'll get to wear a constant reminder of your magic every day. Visit them at www.blessedbemagic.com, and magic is spelled with a CK at the end, and use code WITCHWAVE for 15% off your first order. Check out Blessed Be Magic's modern take on classic magical symbols such as the Triple Goddess and Pentacle in their minimalist jewelry that you can wear every day, anywhere. Again, visit them at www.blessedbemagic.com, that's magic with a C-K, and use code WITCHWAVE for 15% off your first order. This episode of The Witch Wave is brought to you by The Haunts Curiosity Shop, Somerset's Haunted Emporium. Lovers Joseph and Emma bring magic to the mundane from their tiny attic house in England by creating folklore-inspired home fragrance, illustrations, and their original spirit doll designs. The Haunts Curiosity Shop is currently celebrating the launch of their latest fragrance library with unusual hand-blended vegan fragrance, the perfect magical mood elixir for everyday life. Drawing down the moon, pond bathing, and the ghostly neighborhood watch are just a few of their most popular collections which you can explore the concept stories for across their shop. The Haunts Curiosity Shop is currently offering all Witchwave listeners 20% off through the end of March 2022 using the code WITCHWAVE. So check them out at www.thehauntscuriosityshop.com and shop is spelled S-H-O-P-P-E. 
That's 20% off through the end of March 2022 using the code WITCHWAVE. The world is filled with bewitching people, and you might be one too. Welcome to the podcast where art is magic, magic is real, and reality is stranger than dreams. I'm Pam Grossman, and this is The Witch Wave. Hello and welcome to the Witch Wave. Today I have fairy tales and fantasy on my mind because today's guest, Darla Teagarden, is one of the most fantastic and fantastical photographers working today. In our conversation, we discuss how pulling from the worlds of theater and fairy tale and magic was literally a life-saving experience for her. And in my own way, I can relate to that. Now, I was born for whatever reason with an obsession with mythology and magical stories, and I feel so lucky that my spiritual life, my creative life, my professional life are all now centered around the notion of magic making. But I am also aware that my belief in and love of magic deepened when I was a teenager, which happens for a lot of us, and that witchcraft in particular was a way for me to have some agency during a time in my life when so many of us feel out of control. There's puberty happening and school and social pressures. And in my case, I was also coming of age in a household with an older sister who struggled really badly with her mental health and who was an extremely volatile and at times damaging force to be around. Now, this was not her fault in any way. And she is now thriving and doing beautifully all these decades later. But retrospectively, I'm sure that my magnetism to magic offered me some sort of anchoring and comfort and even safety, which I wasn't able to find consistently in my home during that time period. And reflecting on this, I find myself thinking about a specific passage from psychologist Bruno Bettelheim's 1976 book, the uses of enchantment, the meaning and importance of fairy tales. Now, I will qualify this by saying that Bettelheim is a bit controversial, and of course, this book is nearly 50 years old now, but it is still considered a foundational text when it comes to the subject of fairy tales and magic and child psychology. Anyhow, the passage from his book that keeps rattling around in my brain, for better and for worse, is this one. And it's a bit chunky, so here we go. Quote, I have known many examples where, particularly in late adolescence, Years of belief in magic are called upon to compensate for the persons having been deprived of it prematurely in childhood, through stark reality having been forced upon him. It is as if these young people feel that now is their last chance to make up for a severe deficiency in their life experience or that without having had a period of belief in magic, they will be unable to meet the rigors of adult life. Many young people who today suddenly seek escape in drug-induced dreams apprentice themselves to some guru, believe in astrology, engage in practicing black magic, 
or who in some other fashion escape from reality into daydreams about magic experiences which are to change their life for the better were prematurely pressed to view reality in an adult way. Trying to evade reality in such ways has its deeper cause in early formative experiences which prevented the development of the conviction that life can be mastered in a realistic way. Unquote. Oof, a lot to unpack there. Now, I have so many feelings about this passage because on the one hand, I wouldn't be surprised if there's something to the theory that adolescents or even adults who are still attracted to magical, fantastical things perhaps had challenges when they were young. And that fairy tales, fantasy, mythology are soothing to us because they offer us some sort of an alternative to the harsh realities we may have experienced. On the other hand, I find it so small-minded for Bettelheim to assume that nurturing a relationship to magic is purely an exercise of escapism or rejection of reality. I mean, what the fuck is reality anyway? But besides that, while there are some misguided people, certainly, or lost people, who may turn to magic to fix problems that would perhaps be better approached through more material means, there are many, many, many of us who view magic as an effective, meaningful, life-enhancing tool that we can make use of and lean on in fully integrated, healthy ways as adults. Magic does not have to be an escape or an alternative to quote-unquote reality. Rather, it is part of reality and a beautiful and mysterious one at that. I've said it often, but it bears repeating. Magic is not a replacement for medicine or science or psychotherapy or paying your bills and putting in work and showing up in the material world. But it is an additive, a complementary catalyst that can help us navigate the material world with more heart, spirit, creativity, and playfulness. And in doing so, we can become more of ourselves, more vital, more fully engaged with our lives because our imaginations are ignited. Magic has saved my life over and over again, not because I cast some spell that lifted my pain or dissolved my problems, but because it has made me a more present, grateful, productive, and I'd like to think more interconnected and more loving human being. Also, it's fucking fun. And I do not believe that fun is something we're ever supposed to grow out of. In my conversation with the phenomenal photographer, Darla Teagarden, you'll hear how creativity and magic has helped shape her into the brilliant and inspiring artist that she grew up to become. But before we get to that, first, let's check and see what's come through on The Witch Wire. Who is it? Witches! Amelia writes, Dear Pam and the Witch Wave team, thank you for your beautiful and inspiring podcast. I'm at the point in my journey where I'm looking for workshops, talks, or events in my city where I can connect with fellow witches and deepen my craft. Although I found a few things that I'm really interested in, I've been overwhelmed by the amount of events that seem to be attached to the wellness brand. 
I definitely feel some type of way when I see that the majority of celebrations for upcoming Sabbaths are run by yoga studios or led by people who brand themselves as intuitive coaches. I guess alarm bells are going off in my head because as someone who always felt like an outcast and a weirdo, I am suspect of these spaces. They feel like places populated by hot girls in yoga pants. <laughs> At the same time, I'm very conflicted by these feelings. Am I being exclusionary and enacting the gatekeeping that is so often talked about in the online witch community? I was wondering if you have any thoughts or advice on this and how to keep an open mind about how others practice. Thank you so much for your work and time. I appreciate it so much. Hi, Amelia. I had a little chuckle when I first read your note because I recognized so many of those concerns and attitudes in myself. I, by nature, am not a joiner, and at times in my life, I've resisted all kinds of exercise classes or joining gyms or community-based activities for a whole host of reasons, some of which is because, yeah, I do think that a lot of the quote-unquote wellness industry is not only based on status and conspicuous consumption, but some of it is really damaging to the very people it's supposedly trying to help. And I totally admit that there are moments when I have a knee-jerk reaction when I see witchcraft become co-opted or popularized by people or communities that I feel are, I don't know, maybe engaging with it in a shallow way or who are using it because it's trendy just to make money or to grow their own audience. So all of this to say, I get it, I get it, I get it. But I do think it's really important here to try and differentiate between what is healthy self-protection versus what is ego-based projection. In other words, if there are specific classes, communities, teachers that are giving you a vibe that makes you honestly think that you would be taken advantage of, shamed, judged, exploited, lied to, or harmed in any way— Please avoid those people, products, and spaces. Because the sad fact is that some of that is definitely out there. We've seen it on Instagram and in the media and in multi-million dollar companies that purport to be healing, but which are often classist, racist, and just full of bullshit. And I also respect the notion that we all have our own tastes and styles and frequencies and certainly types of messaging or even packaging that resonates with us for different reasons. So if some of this stuff just rubs you the wrong way, and that's going to distract you too much from getting anything out of it, sure, maybe it's just not for you. Maybe you can find a different group or a teacher that clicks for you or even better, maybe you can start that group yourself. Remember, I couldn't find a coven that I vibed with, so I went and started my own. You can do that too. However, 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 with all of this said, I would also love for you to consider that each of us is many things. And we do not have to be limited to the image we have of ourselves or the stories we've told about ourselves or that have been told about us if we don't want to be. In other words, if this hypothetical yoga full moon circle appeals to you on some tiny level, or even if you feel just a little bit curious about it, but then your own inner critic pipes up to talk you out of it or make fun of it, that just feels to me like fear or like your own ego resisting trying something or being something new. Because I can promise you, as much as there are bougie, maybe even obnoxious yoga studios, let's say, there are also incredible yoga studios, and so much of it comes down to the teacher and the community. 
And you don't have to like everyone there or every song they play as long as you're growing or getting something out of it that feels useful or even just interesting. And I promise you can wear whatever the hell you want and not feel pressure to change or fit in. So be the bewitching weirdo in the corner if you want to be. Just don't let your own image of yourself exclude you from an opportunity to expand. And so I would gently suggest that rather than painting all yoga studios or all intuitive coaches or what have you with one brush, and rather than painting yourself with one brush, that you give something new a try if you feel any sense of a pull towards it. Maybe it will change your life, or you'll find an incredible yoga full moon circle or teacher or coach, or maybe it'll be kind of cheesy like you thought, and maybe you'll like it anyway. Or maybe you'll still think it's cheesy, but there will be that one turn of phrase that you hear or that one person you have an interaction with that sets you further down your path. You don't have to keep going to the classes or circles or sessions if you don't want. And you don't have to change yourself to fit in. You get to decide how you spend your time and energy. But as one witchy little black sheep to another, I can tell you that the times I pushed through my own self-consciousness and judgment to try something new that I was nervous about or thought was kind of uncool but secretly felt attracted to anyway, those always had something valuable to teach me. And I never regretted giving it a try. So in sum... Definitely trust your intuition and stay away from anything that feels toxic. And also, stay open to becoming as much and as many selves as you can be. Now, on to my guest. Darla Teagarden is a self-taught artist and mixed-media photographer with a phantasmagoric, otherworldly bent. She creates portraits, most often self-portraits, in theatrical vignettes that she handcrafts out of wood, paper, chalk, and plaster, and which are rife with sacred symbols and occult imagery. Her widely celebrated work has been exhibited in galleries including Rock LaRue in Seattle, Last Rites in New York City, and The Convent in Philadelphia. And it has been published in magazines and books including Black Forest from Candela Books and Series of Dreams from Skeleton Key Press. Her first monograph, Alters, was recently released and it is glorious. Darla joined me from her home in Austin, Texas, via Zoom. Darla Teagarden, welcome to the Witch Wave. Thank you so much for having me and transporting to my room with me. <laughs> oh my goodness. If only that were so in the material world, because your room, I understand, if it's the place where you take all your photographs, is just this amazingly magical space. So can you describe for us what room you are referring to right now so we can transport there, at least in our minds? It is called the parlor. And <laughs> love it. it is filled with everything I love, all the tchotchkes, it kind of looks like a little old lady room slash brothel, which that's my aesthetic. Mm. That's me in a nutshell. Old lady <laughs> brothel. That's me. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And yes. It's got tons and tons of books and pillows. Oh, a huge collection of Harney's tea. Mm. Love some Harney's. It's all about comfort, especially during the pandemic. Absolutely. Cocoon time. Absolutely. 
I always love speaking to visual artists on the Witch Wave because both myself and you have the task of trying to describe your work to people who are listening to us. I certainly have lots of language that I have brought to the conversation or will, but I'd love to hear how you describe your photographs to people who have never seen them before. I grew up living in hotel rooms as like a kind of a homeless kid in Las Vegas in the 80s. And when I closed the door, it was this magical, personal, psychic space. That's what you're looking at when you see my photographs. They're like little poems, but they also have a little bit of a surreal bent that not everybody understands what they're looking at in terms of narrative. (laughs) Mm. that's not my problem. Mm -hmm. I do it for myself. And then if someone can follow along or impart their own experiences onto what they're seeing, what narrative they're seeing, that's amazing. And they have, and they do. Yes. That's how I describe it. Little psychic space poems, not to be pretentious, but that's kind of, (laughs) that's kind of what it is to me for real. I love that. You recently had this beautiful cover story in the Austin Chronicle. Congratulations on that. Thank you. They describe your work this way. Each final work contains a shamanic history, an intoxicating brew of witchcraft and bedtime story, underworld mythology and storybook awe, chaotic dream logic, and funeral formality. (laughs) Ah, I mean, what more does a person want? Thank you, Richard Whitaker. Like, he wrote that. (laughs) So theater, Georges Millier, the fairy stories. And as we know, fairy tales are about dangerous women and dangerous nature. And I am 100% a feminist artist. It's about fairy tales, my time spent in the theater, and I do magic. There's a lot of divination asking for permission. There's a lot of ancestral magic. I didn't want to talk about those things when I first started because it was so trendy and I felt I was always one of those women and young women who were too much all the time. Mm. So I I always held back my spiritual practices and my spiritual beliefs and even my feminism and doing art is just a dialogue with the divine, right? That's Mm -hmm. what we do. That's how we communicate with the divine usually. It's a natural thing to do. There's magic. There's ancestral magic. There's a little candle ritual. There's lots of intention. What I would love to do, because I want to get into the how of your process, but before we do, I want to get into the what people are actually looking at, because I feel like (laughs) we're still being so enigmatic. So why don't we start by describing a few of, if you don't mind, my favorite photographs of yours. And it was so difficult to choose. I think the photograph that made me absolutely fall in love with your work is called Vigil for the Harvest Suitors. Mm. And what does this look like, Darla? It's a faceless being, a witch in this case, and she is floating in space. There are symbols attached to the witch, the moon. There are three floating skulls, right? And these skulls are representative of perhaps the men that wanted to tame her, okay? Mm. (laughs) Mm. Mm -hmm. It makes me wonder back in the day when a woman was threatened with a horrible death for having any witchy tendencies, like how many times she had a lover and she didn't like how the relationship was going and then she just kind of had to do away with him so she wouldn't be... (laughs) I just picture a whole like field of wheat just filled with suitors, you know, people who didn't quite make the cut or that threatened her life. Ah, ah, I love it. And above her head is floating a broom with one, two, three, four, five, six candles (laughs) that are kind of melted on top of the broom. That's right. It's such an arresting, graphic, beautiful photograph. Super magical. Without you giving too many of your tricks away, I would love to know how complex is it for you to create an image like this? Like you're literally floating in space or it looks that way when I'm Mm -hmm. looking at this image. 
for the floating thing, I don't mind giving things away because I don't think it's too mysterious. And but... nobody can do it like you anyway, <laughs> even if they tried. <laughs> Thank you. I am hanging from the tree in my backyard. <gasps> Oh. I have neighbors on all sides huh. and I can see their little faces poking out of their windows looking and <laughs> it's really hilarious, embarrassing, and also sweet <laughs> because they're mm -hmm. just like, what is that girl up to today? Uh, I have fallen from the tree many times. Oh no. It's very like early cinema, theater. What I do in my photos, it's very rooted in theater props wires and things like that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. oh my that's goodness. how it is accomplished yes oh my goodness to be a fly <laughs> on the wall and watch you do this <laughs> yeah I've electrocuted myself I've <laughs> dropped from the no! trees there's all kinds of things I do for this <laughs> oh my goodness do you hear that ladies and gentlemen they are just completely putting themselves out on a limb <laughs> a literal limb for you so we're being brought together today in celebration of your new book. This is a book called Alters. It is, I believe, your first monograph of photographs. Is that correct? That is correct. And it's taken me about 13 years to make one, and I never thought I would make one. Mm. And I didn't think I deserved to have one for a long time. And then I was like, all right, guess what? I'm going to see what happens if I put myself out there. If I'm a little bit vulnerable, I want to see who's listening. And I quit doing this. I have too many things going on and too many things I want to learn how to do. If nobody is paying attention or if no one really cares, I'm going to move on. So <laughs> I started a fundraising thing to make this book. A Kickstarter. A Kickstarter. And I was absolutely blown away by the response. And I was like, okay, this is the universe telling me people are listening, people are watching, and they care. So let's stay on it for a little while longer. And it's been like a year-ish, but it's here and it's in my hands and it's And it's, it's so gorgeous. Good. <laughs> it's so good. So I want to break down... The cover image, first of all, mm -hmm. I imagine it's potentially challenging to choose which is the image that is going to go on your cover. Yeah. And the image that you chose, you know what, I'll let you describe it because it is absolutely stunning. Thank you so much. For a while there, I was pretty prolific too. So I was like, oh my gosh, where do we start? But this one, people call it the goth Mary Poppins, which I... <laughs> Which I love. I love that. But I'm wearing this large brimmed hat with candles and I'm wearing a plaster cast. Part of my face was plaster cast and it's kind of folding away from my face. And I have a heart cut out with blood dripping and there's roses on wire wrapped around my neck. I'm holding a gossamer white flag. Mm. I am sort of reaching out and it's called surrender. Mm. For me, that is a culmination of all the things that have gone into the last 13 years. And it's a pretty striking image. So I thought with help from my editor, I agreed wholeheartedly that that should be the one. So there it is forever and ever. Yes, it's <laughs> such a beautiful image. And it really strikes me as skating this line that I love between like confection and mm. darkness, I mean, it, it definitely has, you know, I, I know the word goth is very overused, but it has that <laughs> kind of like macabre, dark, shadowy aesthetic. But you have the color pink as one of the mm -hmm. only colors besides the black and white imagery. Half of your face is painted pink and the roses are mm -hmm. this pop of pink. It's really delicious, I have to say. Thank you. I feel like my stuff is hard to give a label to because it's not super dark goth it's not exactly fairy tale like those gorgeous they always seem to be ukrainian or russian like these amazing mm -hmm. fairy tale like uh, unbelievable photographs it's in between a lot of different things and i think it's really hard to get invited to things because it skates different lines. You know what I mean? But I think that's what makes it so special because you are obviously referencing this huge spectrum of art history, cinema, cabaret, 
fairy yeah. tale, all of this, but then with your own very personal twist. I mean, I'm absolutely in love with the work, truly. Thank you. I love that the name of this image on the cover of your book is Surrender because it yeah. sounds like that's something you've kind of had to teach yourself to do, especially in absolutely. light of maybe wanting to stop photography. Do you think that's fair yeah. to say? Absolutely. As a writer, as a painter, there's a whole lot of surrendering that has to go in first because you're going to get stuck. People aren't going to like it or not understand it, or it's not academic enough, or it's not whatever enough. That's just the world of art as it is. To begin doing this, I had to decide to get well because I was not for medication for depression and anxiety. I thought it would change who I was, mm -hmm. but I was not functioning and I had a small child to raise. Mm -hmm. I was like, get it together, girl. I started taking my medication, you know, and I, I gutted half of my bedroom. When was this approximately? This was around 2007. Mm -hmm. Me getting well, me functioning properly, and me being vulnerable, me telling my stories, very personal, personal stories, gutting half my bedroom and just making it real. Yeah, I had to, I had to surrender. I had to do a lot of surrendering there mm -hmm. and just kind of asking the universe for permission. I don't tend to ask people for permission. Mm -hmm. But I do ask my ancestors and people who are gone now that I've loved. And it was all kind of pointing towards, yeah, girl, do it, build some stuff. And that's where altars came from. The props and the area that I use, the 10 by 8 or whatever it was, each one is an altar to mm -hmm. something, to someone, to some feeling or to some experience. So that's where altar comes from. Mm. Mm gorgeous. On that note, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. What if you could transform your life into a shiny new existence through your creativity? What if you saw your art and your truly enchanting self for the spell work that it is? In Sarah Faith Godestiner's upcoming four-week online course, Resourcing the Creative Self, Students will ignite the spark within to connect to their magical, spiritual, and creative practices and reconnect the divine artist that lives inside all of us. Whether you are new to artistic expression or are rehabilitating your creative practice, Resourcing the Creative Self will help you enter into artistic self-actualization through creation. You will be introduced to different methodologies, techniques, containers, and practices by Sarah and some stellar guest teachers, including yours truly. Yes, when Sarah invited me to participate in this, I had to say yes, because I admire the way that she blends her artistic practice and her magical practice together with such beauty and integrity. Resourcing the Creative Self begins in March, so join Sarah, me, and her other amazing guest teachers and sign up by going to modernwomenprojects.com. And best of all, Witchwave listeners can take 20% off enrollment with the code WITCHWAVE until February 28th, 2022. So please join us, head over to modernwomenprojects.com, sign up for the Resourcing the Creative Self four-week online course, and use Witchwave for 20% off enrollment through February 28th. Looking to add some more magic to your life? Luna Lux Botanicals offers all-natural bath and body products designed to turn your bath and body care into a ritual and i have used their products myself and i absolutely adore them deepen your connection with the moon with their moon ritual bath and body collection amplify your magical intentions with their crystal body scrub collection or tap into the energy of the elements using their botanically infused elemental bath and body oil collection 
All of Luna Lux Botanicals' offerings are made using only pure and ethically sourced ingredients. Each small batch of product is handcrafted with care and intention by its creator, Cass Hayes, from her home in Portland, Maine. If you're ready to turn your self-care into a ritual, and I highly recommend you do, visit lunaluxbotanicals.com. That's L-U-N-A-L-U-X botanicals.com and use code WITCHWAVE at checkout for 15% off your first order. I love Luna Lux and I just know you will too. I'm a big fan of therapy and have seen firsthand how much talking to a professional has helped me manage my own anxiety and stress and trauma so that I can live the fullest life I possibly can. I've also seen how it's changed the lives of so many people that I care about for the better as well. And that's why I am encouraging you to check out BetterHelp, which is an online counseling service that can provide you with your own licensed professional counselor to talk to via video or phone sessions. And it doesn't have to be that heavy of a topic. Maybe you just need a place to be heard and have an outside perspective on your everyday struggles with your job or your relationships. We all have so much that we're carrying with us these days between our personal issues and, need I say, global issues. And it's just a lot. And I'm telling you, talking it all through with someone who is trained and objective and not a friend or family member is such a gift because their job their actual job is to listen to you and help you work through your feelings about it all so please consider reaching out to the folks at BetterHelp, and they'll connect you with a counselor who you can start chatting with in under 24 hours and they've been doing remote sessions since before it became the norm, so they've built a platform that's accessible, convenient, and secure. Also know that BetterHelp offers financial aid to those who qualify, and they make it really easy to switch counselors so you can find one that you truly click with. Best of all, Witchwave listeners get 10% off your first month of counseling by going to betterhelp.com slash witchwave. That's better, H-E-L-P dot com slash witchwave. Please take care of your mental well-being. It is so necessary, and there is absolutely support out there for you. Do what over a million people have done already and head on over to betterhelp.com slash witchwave, find a great counselor to talk to, and know that I am here rooting for you. Feel well and take good care with BetterHelp. Welcome back to The Witch Wave. Today I'm speaking with Darla T. Garden. So Darla, you were talking about your work as really this healing kind of cathartic experience, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. Your spirituality, your magic, whatever word you choose to define it as, Mm -hmm. was a real driving force behind this. Yes. I really needed to do something that combined getting well, my spirituality, and art. Where I got that language to do so was through a long time ago, I was given a job to work for the Goethe Institute in San Francisco, the German Cultural Center. Mm -hmm. I met this amazing and strange man named Professor Mel Gordon, who wrote Voluptuous Panic. He was this Berkeley University professor of theater. He introduced me to Marnie Wood, which she was a Martha Graham alumni. I was like, who am I? Why am I in the presence of these incredible people? Mm. And I was given this job to kind of do these cabaret productions for the Institute. And in doing so, I learned so much about not only historical things, but just how the theater worked, the backstage drama, the Mm -hmm. ghosts that come with the old theaters. And I met some really integral human beings just doing that out of coming from such a desperate 
upbringing and then kind of allowing permission to come to these people and for them to invite me in was so huge. And I talk about it a lot because it informs so much of what I do now. Mm. Mel Gordon wrote The Erotic World of Weimar Berlin. Ah. And I ended up going by myself to Hamburg and had this whole, (laughs) this was in my early 20s. Yeah. So much of that experience went dormant for a long time because of my illness. And when I decided to get well and do these photos, it came out and it was like, let's use all this juicy stuff that you gleaned from being in the theater and being around these incredible people. Ah, what a gift. You know, it's interesting that Weimar era Germany is a big inspiration for you and a big through line because I think of that time period as obviously this population that was going through intense horror. Mm -hmm. And using drama and theater and dance and all of this, just unfurling their imaginations as a survival mechanism, right? Absolutely. The time that we were kind of representing was a little bit before the horrors of... World War II. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you, you, you Just know. collectively. That yes. little poop. Um, <laughs> what? <laughs> this was around 1919 and things were wild. Anything went. And there was a woman named Anita Berber and she was this prostitute, queer, incredible actress. And that's who I mostly performed as. So I learned about this person. Mm. Mel always used to say she was the Madonna before the Madonna. (laughs) She was way more than Mm -hmm. that. Maybe a little bit if you're talking pop culture Mm -hmm. references, but she just put everything on the line for art. She was one of those tragic figures. Mm. But I learned so much about that time and that place. And it was such a moment for humans to just be completely hedonistic. There was the music and the dance. So of course, that's going to have a huge impact on me, right? Sure, sure. I didn't realize that you were a performer as well. Yeah. So I was a trained dancer. Mm. That's what I was doing in these productions. There's a German, I guess you could call her punk rock legend named Nina Hagen. Oh, sure. So we performed together. Whoa, that's awesome. Yeah, she was a huge moment in my life. I ended up moving in with her after Mm. that into Topanga Canyon. Oh my gosh, if those walls could talk. (laughs) I know, girl, it was insane. (laughs) We lived on this like farm and there was chickens. It was insane. Mm. She would go to ashrams in India and Mm -hmm. there was a lot of spirituality happening there. And even though that particular avenue to the divine wasn't necessarily for me, I learned by watching her participate in the divine every single day, what that looked like, because I had never really seen that. So you weren't raised with some kind of spiritual practice? No, not at all. I'm one of so many who had a troublesome childhood and was a child bride. I was married off when I was 15 and dropped off in Las Vegas. And I lived in a studio apartment in the back of Bob Stupak's Las Vegas world. Oh, <laughs> and like Darla. I had I had a very intense, very strange from childhood to adulthood. There was like no line; it would just kind of blurred into each other. You grew up really fast, <laughs> very fast. So my early twenties, actually, this theater stuff I'm talking about, all of this was almost like my childhood. I got to have some fun. I got to. Mm -hmm. You got to thrive. (laughs) So it was very intense. Yeah, very intense. (laughs) Wow, Darla. Oh, my goodness. What a gift that you were able to get out of that situation Mm -hmm. and really transform your life into this incredibly beautiful, artful offering, if you will. I do. I feel proud. And so should everybody else who has pulled themselves out. It could have went so many different ways. Again, with the ancestral magic, I always pulled from the people I've lost and the people that I love that are no longer here. And I'm like, please don't let this happen. Guide me, you know, and I swear they have Mm. because I have an absolutely charmed life now and I have so much beauty in my life now. Mm. And you make so much beauty. Darla, who taught you how to commune with the ancestors? How did you develop your own magical practice? 
Well, <laughs> <laughs> so, once upon a time. <laughs> <laughs> so again, when I wasn't surviving every single moment, and, you know, meal to meal or whatever, I moved to San Francisco and I became entrenched in the queer community. There was a lot of magic happening in the goth community, the drag community, the trans community. I had a lot of living guides showing me how to connect with your ancestors and also just how to survive because so many of my friends were still dying of AIDS and it was still a real thing. And, you know, every time anyone had sex, there was a lot of fear. Sure. Everyone that I was around was in a survival mode, but it was different. It was more an artful way of living. I learned how to protect myself, how to protect my friends. There's still a lot of violence in the city at that time. At this moment, I learned to survive in a beautiful way, in a meaningful way, not just from one thing to the next. Mm. The queer community and the drag, and I mentioned the coquettes. These people are my tribe. Mm -hmm. People say, well, you weren't really punk rock in the traditional, you were John Waters punk rock. Yes. It was like that. I'll do anything in the street for art kind of punk rock. Yes. All of us would go to the photo booth. I did this in New York too. And we would take these incredible photos that we would dress up full drag and just go walk around Chinatown. Uh, it was art, art, art every day, writing. And I have to mention, there's this incredible woman. She's still alive. She's a legend now. Danielle Hell Willis. Ooh. She wrote Dogs in Lingerie. She is an absolute legend. She was a friend of mine at that time. We would go to one woman shows with her and she had this six foot tall trans woman. Bridget Bratt was her name. She literally was eight feet tall. It was this couple. <gasps> they adopted me and they brought me back to the <laughs> They're like weird mansion somewhere in Oakland. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I learned so much from this writer, just the way their daily life was entrenched in vintage and incense and spirituality and writing. She said she used to turn tricks in Times Square for 25 cents just to piss her rich family off. You know? mm -hmm. She's like this really eccentric, amazing woman. And she's hiding now. No one knows where she is. Wow. She was a huge influence on me. So. Wow. Oh my goodness. These stories. I feel like an autobiography might be in your future, <laughs> Darla. This is incredible. Though I suppose one could argue that your photographs are kind of your own version of an autobiography. And I was yeah. thinking about that in preparation for talking to you, how, as you say, there are some images of other people, but most of your images are self-portraits. Mm -hmm. Again, that Austin Chronicle article, they called you the pagan Cindy Sherman, I which know. is so I fucking was like, cool. What? That is so good. I love yeah. It. I don't know if I necessarily agree, but what a compliment, you know? <laughs> and I love that because she is such a shapeshifter true, true. and you certainly are as well because you're embodying these different characters or different aspects of yourself. They're often very magical, very fantastical. I just jotted down some names and forgive me, I know it might be annoying <laughs> to be compared to other artists, but I think there's like the obvious comparisons we could make in terms of your photography mm -hmm. people like Tim Walker and Francesca Woodman maybe even a mm -hmm. little sprinkling of David LaChapelle all people mm -hmm. I love by the way so I mean that yeah. as the highest of compliments mm -hmm. but I was thinking a lot of painters mm -hmm. the painters who do self-portraits or did self-portraits and so many of them were women Frida mm -hmm. Kahlo and all of my favorite surrealists like Leonora Leonora Carrington. Carrington. Yep, and yeah. Remedios Osvaro and Leonardo Fini. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, yes. So those women are really my main influences aside from Francesca Woodman. I mean, to me, she's God. Hmm. She had the language before anyone else did in terms of body and space, psychosexual. I'm not a very sexual <laughs> photographer, but you know what I mean? Like her body and these kind of surrealist spaces. She's everything to me. Mm. Those painters, Leonora Carrington. And there's a lot of illustrators now that I see charged objects on an altar almost. Like you see a woman with the broom and the hemlock on the side. And mm -hmm. I absolutely adore that kind of language because to me, it's the opposite of street photography, which is incredible, but mine is the opposite. Everything is so intentional. 
it's like in poetry where you say every word has to have its place there. There's no extra. There's no fat. Yes. When there's something in my photo, it's 100% there for a very specific reason. There's nothing extraneous. And I understand you make a lot of your own props and costumes as well. I mean, you're just like a one witch operation over there. I don't have anything else. Like, I'm not rich and I'm not, I don't have a cachet of uh, treasure. (laughs) Yeah. Or just people who can make stuff for me. So I'm kind of my one woman band. Which I'm grateful for, because what if I was rich and I could afford for someone to make me a full set? I don't think it would have the intimacy that it does. Mm. Like David LaChapelle, you know, he's fantastic, but he has a ton of people working for him to realize his vision. And that's great. But I love how it's just very small in not a bad way. But it feels so epic and mythic and oh, thank you. kind of circling back to this idea of self-portraiture. I think about that a lot in terms of people who present as feminine in the world and especially all the pressure to look mm-hmm. a certain way, especially with mm-hmm. Instagram and TikTok, et cetera, et cetera. We've heard it all mm-hmm. a million times. I just wonder putting yourself in front of the camera the way you do, if there's anything transformative about that, about centering your own image on your own terms? Mm. I disassociate. (laughs) Mm. (laughs) When I'm looking at those things, it's not me, but it is kind of like a trance. Like I get in there, I'm by myself. There's no one home. I close the door. I lock it. (laughs) And I just get into whatever weird thing I'm doing and I kind of trance out. I just kind of become somebody else, really. Mm. It's a form of meditation, honestly. It's about somebody else. But at the same time, it's about the inside of my brain. I picture the inside of my brain with having all these little doors. And when I'm about to do a shoot, I open one of those little doors and I look inside. So whoever's in there is what you see in the photographs, you know. <laughs> oh, gorgeous. On that note, we're going to take another quick break and we'll be right back. This episode of The Witch Wave is brought to you by Rewilding Our Intuition, a self-paced, pre-recorded audio workshop created by intuitive tarot teacher and prior Witch Wave guest, Lindsay Mack. Rewilding Our Intuition is a workshop designed to assist folks in the initiatory process of opening to and trusting in their inner voice. Participants will leave this workshop with an abundance of resources, exercises, and skills to help them root into their inner knowing, as well as supportive tarot spreads, prompts, and inquiries to help them if they get stuck or caught in doubt and contraction. The Rewilding Our Intuition workshop includes hours of pre-recorded, in-depth audio sessions with full transcriptions, a gorgeous workbook, and lifetime access to the material. Enrollment for this offering is open, and course material is available for immediate download. I can't say enough good things about Lindsay Mack and her courses, so do go on ahead and check out lindsaymack.com. That's L-I-N-D-S-A-Y-M-A-C-K.com. And you can sign up and learn more about this course. And be sure to use code WITCH for 10% off your tuition. Once again, that's lindsaymag.com. The new course is Rewilding Our Intuition, and code WITCH will get you 10% off your tuition. The Path 365, Daily Direction for Ladies and Mothers, Witches and Others, is a book that allows you to open your mind, body, and spirit to a path that is uniquely yours. As a gateway spirituality guide, it weaves coping mechanisms identified in neuroscience and mental health that address mind, body, and spirit, and incorporates them into an easy-to-read daily guide. Author Susie Newell received her doctorate from the University of Cincinnati with a focus on coping mechanisms. This book gently encourages people to open their mind to a spiritual path that feels right for them. 
Like a daily oracle read for the soul, The Path 365 takes you through a journey of positive self-discovery and encourages you to incorporate your practice into every aspect of your being. Whether you have a solid spiritual practice already or are exploring your options, The Path 365 is a unique guide to creating a path of your own. Visit them at thepath365.com for ordering options. And be sure to use code WITCHWAVE for free shipping. And you can give The Path 365 a follow on your favorite social media platform. We are all in this thing together. Create a path that works for you. Would you like even more Witch Wave? Then come join us on Patreon, where you'll get bi-weekly bonus Witch Wave Plus episodes, ad-free Witch Wave episodes, and detailed show notes for all. Rewards also include magical merch and giveaways, early heads up about my workshops before they sell out, and all backers get access to our exclusive digital coven, where I lead monthly rituals and video chats, and where you can connect to a community of other wonderful witches. So head on over to patreon.com slash witchwave and sign up. It's a fabulous way to get more magic in your life and to support the show. Thanks so much. Welcome back to The Witch Wave. Today I'm speaking with Darla T. Garden. So Darla, let's get into the photography of it all. First of all, I'm not even aware of how you learned photography. Are you self-taught? Did you take classes? How did you come into this particular medium? I am 100% self-taught for good or bad. (laughs) I'd say for good. (laughs) I will say my early adulthood was filled with incredible photographers and I modeled a lot. I kind of did some fetish modeling or whatever. Mm -hmm. A lot of my friends were photographers and they had dark rooms. So I was soaking it in at that point. But it kind of stops there. After that, by the time I got to photography, I was using a portion of my bedroom and I had a point and shoot camera. Mm. To this day, when I look at photographer friends of mine, I go, oh my gosh, you're a real photographer. I use it as a means to. It's a medium in which I tell my story, but I do not consider myself like this photographer because it's a real thing that people spend years trying to perfect. And I am not saying I'm one of those people. What I'm am saying is I took a point and shoot. And from there, I saved a little bit of money and got a used, um, you know, a camera. And I just kind of tried it. And I'm still trying it. Mm. I'll always be a student of photography forever and ever. But I think <laughs> that's the best way to orient oneself is forever a student, forever I agree. learning and being curious and forever experimenting. It's good advice for anyone. Just always be curious. I would like to do a little street photography, maybe go travel somewhere. I don't know. I'm all over the place, but the things I like to do pretty much are encapsulated in alters the book because mm. it's kind of like, you know, that whole fairy story. Sure. I, I sure. can never get enough. <laughs> ah, and you do it so exquisitely well. Thank you. There's a lot of quotes, of course, from Susan Sontag that come to my mind whenever I'm speaking mm-hmm. with a photographer, but mm-hmm. these in particular really jumped out at me in knowing I was going to speak with you today. She writes, quote, photography is an elegiac art, a twilight art. Most subjects photographed are, just by virtue of being photographed, touched with pathos. And then she goes on to say, quote, All photographs are memento mori. To take a photograph is to participate in another person's mortality, vulnerability, mutability, precisely by slicing out this moment and freezing it All photographs testify to time's relentless melt. Ooh, I know. It's the good (laughs) shit, right? It is. So, of course, 
photography is the weirdest because it's like anyone can do it, especially now with a camera in your pocket and do it very well. I feel like my pathos is imparted onto whoever I'm taking a picture of. It's really hard to explain, but photography for me is so neither here nor there. Mm. And when you say it's memento mori, it is. It's like paper. Mm. It's on literal paper. And I see them in vintage stores, just like people's entire lives thrown into a bucket where strangers can rifle through and buy a dollar a piece. I love that about photography. I love that the written word is eternal. It's on the page. It's in this book on a shelf. It can be held. But photography is this piece of paper imprinted and its only value is how much it means to you in that moment. And then it can be gone. Mm. I love that about it. And when you're talking about art, quote unquote, photography, to me, there's no difference. Mm -hmm. This is all for me, for my son, for my state of, of survival, my happiness. If someone takes it somewhere else 30 years from now, 50 years from now, that's fantastic. That's not my motivation. Mm -hmm. This whole thing is ephemeral. It's very fleeting to me. Yeah. Memento yeah. mori, you know, memento mori. Sure. Can I ask, do you do anything that's only entirely digital or do you always work with film or <laughs> with an eye towards printing or making a book? So let me just tell you, like, <laughs> since I got into the photography thing, it's such a bitchy <laughs> <laughs> well, any art, there's a lot of bitchy upping one another kind of thing. And there's this big lump in the throat of everyone. And that is analog versus digital yeah. because one means more to the other. And in a way, they're right. Analog, there is a skill to produce those photographs in a beautiful way. But I'll tell you something. I've known some world-class incredible photographers, old school guys, right? They're all men, by the way, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is telling. But they all said the same thing to me. Going into that dark room was great. But let me tell you, digital, it frees me. And yeah. I got to tell you, it frees me too. Yeah, yeah. If I had to learn how to make a print in the dark room, which is an incredible skill, I wouldn't have had that immediacy that I needed in that moment to mm -hmm. get well and to tell my story. Yeah. I feel like with the phone in your pocket that it's so freeing and it's a beautiful thing. It's two different things to me. One's an art and one is a means to tell your story. It's ephemeral. I don't know, Darla. I think what you're making <laughs> is pretty clearly art, but I hear what you're saying. Thank you. I mean, come on now. <laughs> I also feel like we evolve with the tools that are given to us in any moment in history. And I couldn't help but think about spirit photographers of the 19th mm -hmm. century and how they were trying to capture ghosts, whether or not they were being sincere about it or they were kind of being <laughs> tricksters like William H. Mumler and a lot of those people. With every iteration of technology, there are people who then take that technology and try to use it as a tool for supernatural storytelling. And to me, what mm -hmm. you do is just an extension of that. And it's completely artful. Well, that is a really cool thing to say. I've never heard that, but it's kind of true. It is ghosty. When I look at my photos, I see a ghost. I don't see myself. I see something very in between. And it is because no matter what you believe in, you cannot deny that when you look at a photograph, it's not real and it's not fake. It's like mm -hmm. in between. Very liminal. Yes, very liminal. And there's something so inherently magical about that. And now it's available so readily to everybody. Yes, but not everybody can do beautiful things with it. Let's well, be we all, honest. We all do what we want to do with it. And it's not all great, right? <laughs> <But> <laughs> For sure, my friend. For sure. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit more about your process. At the end of Alters, this gorgeous book, you have included some of your, I believe you call them storyboards. Is mm -hmm. that right? Yes. Which are essentially these gorgeous collages you make to dream up and prepare yourself for the photo shoots that you're going mm -hmm. to do. And I'd love for you to share just a little bit more of that process with us. 
I'm a very visual person and a very concise person. So I don't like the idea of just going and taking photos and grabbing props. I'm very specific in what I want to do. So I cut out shapes and I cut out vibes. There's one, it's me with a bunch of Mickey Mouse heads. I don't have a leg. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And when I first started piecing that together, I originally had Coke bottles, you know, that sort of pop culture things. So it's very vibing it out not only where my body is going to be in that space but what kind of message I'm trying to get across to me collage is everything that's how children learn how to put ideas together and a lot of my friends we did these things we called it scrapbook Mm -hmm. we would sit on the floor and scrapbook our dreams basically It's a a vision board, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) I think people have been doing that for as long as there's been paper and ways to transplant outside ideas and molding them into something specific to you. Oh, yeah. It's a manifestation spell. Absolutely. At its core, that's what it is. Oprah can call it whatever she wants, but (laughs) it is a spell. I love your obsession with Oprah. It's so cute. (laughs) I, I mean, it. come on. Who isn't <laughs> obsessed me, right? with Oprah? Please. <laughs> I know, right? Leave her alone. She's <laughs> perfect. Just the way she is. <laughs> but getting back to your vision boarding or your storyboarding. So mm-hmm. am I to understand you just kind of sit down and you cut out? Are you literally cutting out scraps from magazines or old books? I am notorious for destroying books, which is awful, I know. For the right reasons, (laughs) not like what's currently happening in your state, (laughs) unfortunately. I use anything that I have, and that goes for everything I do. (laughs) I spend a lot of time at Goodwill. I don't know why everyone doesn't just live at Goodwill. (laughs) Everything's there. You just have to know what to look for, you know? (laughs) Yeah. I'm all about old newspapers and old magazines and old books and getting out your crayons and getting out your your glue stick, which by the way, I think is so cute and amazing that now all the drag queens, I don't know how long, I don't remember them ever using it, but they glue down their eyebrows. Oh, yeah. Always the purple one too, I notice. Yes. You know when it's dry because it stops being purple. (laughs) Anyway, so there you go. I didn't know that little tip. Good to know. So I'll use those things to just kind of glue things down. That's how I kind of figure out what I'm going to do in that square space Mm -hmm. that a lot of people call formal. (laughs) (laughs) Last question as we're winding down here. What is your relationship to magic and to the word witch these days in your life and in your art? So again, harking back to my early, early humanhood, I grew up in a pretty magical city up and around it, San Francisco. That's where I spent my early 20s and where I started doing that theater stuff. There was a lot of witches there. And almost all of the ones I knew back then were trans women. Mm -hmm. There was one woman in particular named Omowen, and she would go on stage and she looked exactly like Nico, Mm. 70s Nico. The Velvet Underground, (laughs) yeah. So like, and she played whatever that instrument Nico played and she would sing in Nico's voice, you know, (sighs) and she was a witch. So it was Danielle Hell Willis. And they taught me a lot about divination, candle magic about intention, how to bring things to you in a practical sense and also a spiritual sense. I was just so taken by the beauty of the process of magic and how it wasn't when I think of going to church every Sunday or something like that. This was every day, 24-7, wake up. It was the tea they drink. It was the kimono they wore. It was the makeup they wore, the books they read. That's where I learned about Leonora Carrington and all the greats. They had it all in their back pocket and they were so excited to share it with little old me, you know, my 20 year old self. So that's kind of where magic started for me. And this is really funny. My neighbor used to be Anton LaVey. (gasps) No way. Yeah. So for those who don't know who that is, he wrote the Satanic Bible and a number of other books. And he was very, well, you can describe him probably better than I can, but very tongue in cheek, hedonistic. (laughs) Yeah. When we think of Satanism, 
he brought it to the pop culture forefront, but I feel like he was more of a um, uh, used car salesman. He was <laughs> he was hilarious. Like kind of a he made, he made artist us, in a way. Absolutely. Kind of draggy was, if you think about it, a character. He was just trying to get laid. That's all it was. <laughs> Which he did. All hey, the time. that's a motivating but, factor for lots of magical people. So. You do you, Anton. <laughs> but we we would invite him over for dinner and make him horrible. Like none of us knew how to cook, and he would make us call him doctor. <gasps> <laughs> he was fine. He was fine. But the whole idea of Satanism and Levian Satanism mm-hmm. that was big back then. That was sure, big. sure. But when I looked at him and I looked at what it really represented, I was like, you know, I'm gonna go back over here to the pagan side of things and sure. it wasn't feminist enough for me <laughs> yeah yeah for sure that's very important to me <laughs> yeah well that certainly comes through in your work it is so feminine and feminist super magical super witchy and i just find it and you utterly enchanting Thank darla you so tea garden please tell us how people can connect with you and how they can get this gorgeous book, Alters. You can find me at Darla underscore T on Instagram. Mm-hmm. That's T-E-A? T-E-A, yes. So D-A-R-L-A underscore T-E-A. Mm-hmm. And that's where I share a lot of information. And then I have a website, DarlaTeagarden.com. And you can get my book. I had to figure things out because of the whole pandemic freak out. I don't know what's going on with the post. I don't know. Those shipping issues are real. It's terrible. So luckily, my incredible publisher, Skeleton Key Press, is based out of Oslo, Norway. And so if you are in Europe, you can get the book from Skeleton Key Press. And if you are in the North America... You can order my book from Book People, which is an independent bookstore here in Austin, Texas, an amazing place. And they will be having my things online pretty soon. Australians? I don't know. (laughs) We'll have to wait on that for a minute. (laughs) Okay. We'll be creative. We'll be creative. Well, listen, Darla, it has been an absolute delight to speak with you today. I absolutely adore your work. And now I adore you. So thank you so much for taking the time to be with me here on The Witch Wave today. Well, I stan you, as the children say. You're incredible. (laughs) So thank you for having me. It was so much fun. That's it for the show. Thank you again to Darla Teagarden for sharing her spectacular camera conjurations with me. Do you have questions, feedback, need some witchly advice, or just want to share something magical that happened to you recently? Drop us an email at witchwavepodcast at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you, and you just might make it on The Witch Wire. The Witch Wave is a phantasmophile production written and produced by me, Pam Grossman. This episode was recorded and edited by Josh Wilcox, and myself. Our theme music is the song Hand and I by Lycanthia. Special thanks go to Matt Freeman, Laura Antal, and Cece Pascal. You can check out information about this and other episodes on our website and now by Witchwave merch at witchwavepodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on your favorite podcast app and give us lots of sparkly stars. It really, truly makes a difference and helps other people find the show. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at WitchWavePod. And you can check out my witch emoji for iPhone by going to witchemoji.com or downloading it in the App Store. Please consider ordering my book, Witchcraft, or picking up my book, Waking the Witch, which is available everywhere now. And if you want more Witch Wave or you would just like to support the show, please join us over on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash witchwave. Thank you so much for listening. Witches are the future. I'll catch you next time on The Witch Wave.